Hello, everybody, and welcome to Eternal Mooncast special program, Bishocha Sunshi Slumber Party. We're on a current adventure of the React series of the Sailor Moon Deep Dub. This episode will be the discussion portion for episodes 41 through 45 of the Tree of Doom arc. Woof! Sailor Moon has a long and rich history, but have you seen everything? I'm Relia, and these are my friends Monica and Michi. We're three lifelong Sailor Moon fans who dove headfirst into the fandom and have stayed there ever since. We love being part of the amazing fan community surrounding this genre-defining series. If you've been watching and you want to jump to a particular episode, timestamps are going to be down in the description. Now, we know some of you may not have seen the deep dub, and some of you may not even have been alive then. You, you can make them to us so later. Real. If you want to watch along with us and enjoy our reactions, join our Patreon and get in on the fun. It's free. Please enjoy. The link is also in the description below. All right, so let's delve into discussing episodes 41 to 45. As usual, Monica and I have watched them both in Japanese and in the Deke English dub so that we can give a little bit more color commentary about them. The Japanese episode numbers, if you're following along with that, are episodes 47 to 51. And we'll be summarizing each episode, talking about them, and sharing our thoughts. We're excited to share our favorite moments, what we loved, and everything to tweet. Join the chat, post the comments, and let us know what you thought about each episode, too. We just want everyone to know that the following statements are the personal opinion of Eternal Mooncast. Eternal Mooncast does not represent Toei Animation, Fizz, or the Sailor Moon intellectual property in any way. Okay. Now that we got all that, okay. let's start with our first episode. This is, we are now starting season two. Uh, yeah. The Doom Tree arc at the beginning of this. Yeah. Our fun, this fun little filler arc. This arc. Yeah. Yeah. A delightful filler arc. Yep. So we're season two of Sailor Moon is, of course, known in the Japanese as Sailor Moon R, which we learned is short for Sailor Moon Returns. Funnily enough, that works out really well. And that actually pairs nicely with the Japanese title of the very first episode of Sailor Moon R. Monica hit us with that title. The Japanese title is Moon Returns, colon. The mysterious aliens appear. I wrote this down and I have it handwritten down and my handwriting is awesome. The mysterious, it's telling you, this is exactly, it's telling you exactly what happened. Sailor Moon returns and the mysterious aliens appear. And that's so, sure. What so happens, often that the title does my job for me. It, it, it is giving you the episode summary. I'm really just gilding the lily. Um, <laughs> but Michi, what is our deep title? So I hear this in like the most 90s voice. I want you to hear it in that like commercial where they're screaming at you voice. The return of... I like I can because I'm picturing the exact announcer that did like the the promos for the movies when they finally got released on like Cartoon Network. I'm hearing that guy's super dramatic voice doing the yes. return of Sailor Moon. Yeah. Um, so I'm here for it. It's a perfectly good title. I think it's the kind of title that you deliver when you just finished a season where it could have easily been the end of the entire series, but then you decided to come back for more. So here we are. It's the return of Sailor Moon returns. The mysterious aliens appear. Let's get into Sailor Moon returning and some mysterious aliens appearing. So first of all, before we do that, we can talk really briefly about the new opening animation that we have for Sailor Moon R. Because Monica, I'm assuming that you will have caught it too in your watch. I think it's I think it's pretty cool. It's not as psychedelic as the season one opening animation with the with the weird hot air balloon. Our best friend fish balloon. Fish balloon. Yeah, Bukali. Iconic. Iconic. It's so uh, this one is a little bit more straightforward, but I think it really captures the mood of the first few episodes in fact, of the Doomtree arc, which is that it's really focused on Usagi's distress at trying to find her way back to Mamoru. And, and like, she's constantly dealing with, in the opening intro, she's got these visuals where she's struggling with her alternate identity being a separate part of her and then wanting to catch up to him again in various ways. And so I think that, weirdly, while this will not continue to be the case throughout all of R, it actually serves very well as an opening to what the emotional arc is going to be in the Doom Tree arc, certainly for Serena slash Usagi, in terms of how that's pitched. A couple of cool things that I like about this. The R opening is, in my opinion, the first opening where all four of her inner senshi are getting equal screen time. Because the prior opening was was a lot of Mercury and Mars and Moon 
walking around the ruins of the moon kingdom while fountains like streamed around them. And then in this win R, they're now featuring all four inners with equal screen time. Another thing that's very cool in the Sailor Moon R opening is that she effectively has a henshin sequence that is just for the opening. They came up with a whole different henshin for it. It's short, but it is specific just to the opening, which is really cool. Just thought we'd hit on a couple things specific to our new opening when we can. For the record, also, this new opening is only in the jet. Oh, yeah, no. In in Geek, we'll never get a new opening. Nope. We will be fighting evil by moonlight, winning love by daylight, and it will be the same exact clips every time. It doesn't matter that Beryl is dead. Beryl is still the enemy we will show in the opening. Nice mug. Oh, yes, this is my Sailor Moon mug that I purchased for Spirit Halloween. Brought up a good point I didn't think of. Or it says, and the dub gave it the Moon Kingdom a time span of happening only a thousand years ago, which really confused me. It's firmly taking place in the middle of the Middle Ages. Yep. Yep. Right. Like, Battle, of Hastings. Battle of Hastings. Oh my gosh. All right. Because so, you know, from the time period, the was not the joke. Yeah. It's a it's a worthwhile enough wrench referential compared to other options. How often can we specifically cite something that took place in like 993 AD? Other than, of course, the fall of the Moot Kingdom. Right. So, well, oh, before we go off the openings. Yeah, there is the second opening. I still thought of that one as more heavily featuring the Mars and Mercury, but maybe I'm remembering it wrong. Because after a certain, level. like, when they changed openings, I would rewatch it in my rewatches of the Japanese. But after that, I'm, I'm, for the sake of time, when I'm rewatching in Japanese, I'm skipping ahead two minutes and ten seconds into it to get the episode started. So it's entirely possible that I am misremembering that. I'll allow it. All right, so let's talk about this first episode. We start out, Usagi is just, Serena's just living a normal life. And then something comes crashing from space and takes over an apartment in the middle of the night. There's this giant crater and all of Japan's citizens just rush out to investigate it. They stand perilously close to the edge and they're all shoving each other. Serena is there. Several of the other girls are there. They don't know each other except that they know they go to school together. Darian is also there and for no reason starts bullying Serena again. So we see that when he doesn't have his memories, he's just a jerk. Then we cut to a male and female, obviously alien couple. They have blue and pink hair and they are green. They are Alan and Anne. They're hanging out being very like lovey-dovey romantic. The next day, male and female humans who look exactly like Alan and Anne show up at our new students at Serena's school. They are presenting themselves as a brother and sister, which is a choice. Alan instantly has the hots for Serena and, like, really wants to play his alien flute for her and is incredibly jealous about this. Uh, Later that day, though, Anne then sees Darian and she's, like, equally as H-O-T-O to go about Darian. She is. She is. But before she can, like, flirt, she collapses from, like, oh, no, I've run out of energy. Alan then takes her back to their evil apartment where we see we get our first shot of like a giant evil tree with a big root ball that essentially looks like a massive human heart. And Alan uses energy from that tree to revive Anne, but the tree then starts to wither. So obviously it's very clear that they need energy. They're getting energy from the tree, but now the tree needs energy. So they make a plan that they're going to get energy from Earth to save the tree so that they don't die. In order to do this, they're going to use essentially a Yoma. They call them Cardians. And they start out as a different little cards. And they pick one. And they send their Cardian, which is Vampyr, off to collect some energy for them. Vampyr is attacking a civilian. Luna and Artemis witness it. So the Vampyr sees Molly, who's on the phone with Serena, and attacks Molly next. She drops the phone. Luna and Artemis debate waking the scouts, but they try to fight it off themselves. Serena shows up, though, because she's worried about Molly. They were on the phone together. Luna tells Serena to transform. Serena assumes this is 100% definitely a dream because, like, there's a monster in the room. There's cats talking to her. Like, this is absolutely a dream. Awesome. Which is not working out well for the cause of good. 
So then Luna uses the Luna mind meld to restore all of Serena's memories. She cries because this is like very traumatic. She really doesn't want to fight, but she puts on a brave face for Luna. She does her thing. She uses Moon Tierra magic to, to kill the Cardian. Uh, Alan and Anne then appear in the sky in their alien forms. It's very difficult to talk about them because they are Alan and Anne both in their alien forms and in their human forms, unlike in the Japanese. I'll often just try to clarify if it's Alan the alien and Anne the alien or Alan the person and Anne the person to try. I, and- I loved that the gift dub was just like, they're, they could have called them like bleep and blorp. That would have been just fine. Like uh-huh. they were like, no. These green aliens, these little green man and woman, are named Alan and Ann from space. Yeah, even in their space where they really yeah. are named Alan and Alan Ann. Alan and Ann. Not names they chose on Earth. No, their names. That's, that's their names from space. Yeah. So they appear in the sky introducing themselves. They're like, we didn't know there was a magical person living on this. And then they disappear. And Serena is again like sad that she has to bid farewell to her normal life. And that's the episode. Yeah, that's the episode. Over, that's the episode. Let's go. Why do I love it? I love it so much. Let me give you some highlights from my notes. And also, I would just for the record, I did not watch it in Japanese. I watched the biz dub. I was not having a good week and I didn't feel up to reading subtitle. So I put on the biz dub and this, so this is going to be a dub comparison for me. Well, that all brings us yeah. perspective for, for yeah, the there we go. So, make. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I also know that the biz dub is really faithful to the exactly. Agent plot line they, they didn't change a lot of stuff and i think there's a couple places where i'm like i think maybe you should have changed the, maybe localized it a little bit more so i'll talk about the comparisons between the two dubs i think that would be an interesting perspective also i was like fuck. here's some notes i have from the deke yep, which include big hole i think someone says that at some point just like ah big hole big hole, big hole. mama still sucks aliens discover human sex for the first time don't remember what that's about, but that sure was in my note. That's right. Yep. Um, I love the Doom Tree. Yeah. Oh, 100%. 11 out of 10. Yeah. I also find their motivation very reasonable. And unfortunately, they are also the world's worst predators. The rest of this, like, mini arc would be a comedy of errors about these two aliens who very could sustainably, like, seed off of humans and be, like, a real threat and kind of scary, um, being just the worst at being their species and acquiring yeah. their food. Also, I just finished reading all of Dungeon Meshies. Like, the whole monsters as part of an ecosystem was in my brain. And we're watching. Well, they're just, they're just best. They are. So much deep smack talk in this episode. Like, I know that the deep dub is basically not available anywhere. It's lost media. If you find it, you can find torrent of it. Watch on our Patreon. And watch on our Patreon for watch sure. That's the, the best way to find it. It is free. It is free. Unless you uh, feel you're... like giving a dollar and that, that you yeah. get a whole week early. You could tip us. The the monster it was named Vampeel. Right. In yeah, the deep no. dub. Yeah. Which I thought was a good pun. And it, I was expecting it to be the same pun in Japanese. I was like, oh, did they just steal that completely? Did they find one right. that works yeah. in both languages? No, the monster is vampire in English. And they kept that for the Viz dub. They sure didn't pay a woman to sing over and over again. Oh, or I made a comment about it. Fun fact, vampire is the first time Megumi, oh, it's about the... Oh, yeah, the voice actress. Sorry. Harper's voice. Yep. Yeah. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to derail. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, and for my Viz dub notes, I also had a note being very excited about the new animation. I really like the little like subway train at the beginning. It gives a very wistful feeling. Yeah. And it conveys a sense of wistfulness and bittersweetness almost. I liked it there, but of course some of the greatest hits from that. The things that they have the that, that are also in the deep dub opener, like where she's like running towards Mamaru in his endemian outfit, she hugs him and it's that's in all of them, so I guess they had the rights to that frame, the serious frames. I don't, there's some of this that is in the Deke opener and some of it that isn't. I'm not sure what the deal with that is. I, I suspect it has something to do with the rights, but I don't know why that one, that part is something they had the rights to. Yeah. 
the the whole issue of what they had the rights to and what they didn't is so complex because if you look at having just watched the Japanese version of these episodes and then being able to compare them to the Deke version, I love Alan's iconic Deke flute solo. I think I recently was messaging you guys that like one day I was just sitting there and I was like, I have Alan's flute solo stuck in my head. And yes. they're like, what reminded you? Like nothing. It just showed up there. Now it's a banger, but it just came into my head. His flute song is almost exactly the same as the flute song in Japanese, but slightly different. So there's two possibilities. One possibility is that they did not have the rights to present the flute song exactly as is. So they had to make it just different enough to count as a new song. Or the other possibility is they just thought they could do it a little bit better. And I guess I, we don't know. That, my guess is that because none of the background music is the same, like none of the music is the same and none of the sound effects are the same, that they just simply didn't have the rights to the audio. Uh, which meant we got more Bob and that's not a bad. Like, yes, we love more Bob. Yeah. Each of music didn't need to go that hard. And it did not. not. And it is unparalleled in all other Sailor Moon versions. Like, I just have to say, the deep music goes the hardest. And I love it. It is the one thing where I'm just like, you know what? You did bring something new and wonderful to the original. The aliens are named Ail, A-I-L, and mm -hmm. An, A-N. That is their, those are their alien names. Those are their names from space. And then they, their cover names are Seijiro and Natsuni Ginga. And someone even points out oh, sound like Melvin. Like, that sounds made up. Yeah. Well, that shit's fake. I love that Melvin Flash Umino is on them immediately. Yeah, so totally quick. So, yeah. See. And of course, if you're not, like, I think probably a lot of people have either spotted this already or already know this about the original Japanese version of this, which is that, of course, their names being Ale and Anne. Their names are aliens. Like, yeah, it is, it is a pun on just the word alien. So if they were like, oh, my name's Ale and my name is Ian. Uh, that's basically what was attempted in that. So if he was just a classic pun. I am surprised Deep didn't go for the pun. They went as close as they could while trying to also make these names that were like, so they did Alan and Anne. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's as close to the sun as they dared to go. Yep. Uh, for, for Ale, they could have gone Alex. They could have gone any number of routes. They specifically went the one that sounds the most like Alien. Alien. Yeah. I, when I was younger, I did not care for this arc at all. And now that we're rewatching it, I'm like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Affectionate. Could you win? I feel, feel the same way. Like, I still, yeah. it's, you have... And you see this more in the way that people react to movie series where there's the original movie and then they do a sequel and the sequel is blah, where often the first movie, if you look at like MCU movies, like if you look at Iron Man or you look at Thor as a couple classic examples, the first movie is really strong because the plot is the most personal to the main character. Like Iron Man is dealing with his the fallout of his own company this is an emotional reckoning and a, a force of personal growth for him in addition to dealing with a problem and the problem feels like it is relevant it's not like random and made up same with thor it's literally his own brother they're dealing with family drama and so when you come to the second movie often people are like yeah the second movie was kind of garbage it was like some random enemy like it didn't feel you, when you start off with something that is deeply personal, it's very hard to move on from there because you either have to go personal but bigger or discard the attempt to be personal and just try to do something completely different with it. And so when you go from Sailor Moon first season, which is big, it's personal, it could have easily been the complete story, into the Doom Tree, I think it's unsurprising that anyone's initial reaction would be like this sort of feels like random chump change that we're dealing with like this doesn't feel meaningful impactful big but when we go back to it now now that we first of all know there's a whole arc of a bunch of seasons that touch on a lot of stuff we find the more fun and delightful things about this series about this arc and the way that they made this a bridge from what could have been standalone season one into 
no, actually, there's going to be a bunch of seasons of this crap. And we have to deal with the fact that we had a bunch of closer plot lines where everyone lost their memories and got a happily ever after normal life. And now we have to, like, undo that. So, yeah, I think that it's been nice, I agree, to come at this with the sort of fresh eyes of distance and say, yeah, this is worthless and delightful. They are not siblings when they are aliens, but on Ura's question. They are boyfriend and girlfriend in their alien identity. Mm -hmm. And then they're like too into pretending to be brother and sister at the school for whatever. There, There's a like a moment where I think Ahn is like, why? Oh, no, my camera just turned off. Bye. I love it when that, I love it when my good webcam just like turns off. Just eh. I have another webcam. The one that's built. Let me adjust my thing so you can see me. Hello. Oh, now my oh. microphone did frame. Get out of there. Hello, everyone. I have a very nice microphone. Do too. I do. So, why was right? Odd is like, why do we have to pretend to be brother and sister? And Ale is like, cuz. Yeah, it's it's a weird choice because literally the first time that we see them talking to each other. In the Japanese, Alan, because they're always like thinking about constellations and stuff. And he's like, Perseus fell in love with Andromeda and Perseus would do anything for Andromeda. And I'm thinking about you right now, Anne, and I really want to be your Perseus. Like this is they establish early on. These two are a couple. They are not brother and sister. They are in deeply in love and they constantly are horny for each other, but also for other people. But they also decided to be brother and sister in their cover for no reason. And that causes them all manner of problems and makes them look really incestuous to all the humans around them. I think some part of me when I was younger didn't like latch on to just how much of a freak both of them are. Yeah. Uh, and I, as an adult, and it makes them funnier to me. Yeah, oh, honey. Yeah. Yes. But she's so weird and so nuts. They suck so much. Like, yeah. their redeeming quality is that they are totally irredeemable, both of them. Yes. Of their only redeeming quality is that, like, they genuinely have a valid justification for the their evil general scheme. They need to steal energy or they will die. Like, right. that is a fair villain justification. I have to give you that as fair. But also... You guys are the worst in so many ways. And you just enjoy being terrible. And you try to have interpersonal relationships with people. And they are off the rails every time. Oh, sorry. Go, go for it. Go ahead. I was just going to say random theory. What if... You know, I'm looking... What if... Ashley... If you could... What? Right. You were like, what if... No, never mind. I was like, oh, I should say. I was like, that's too spicy for this for this show that's for something after but i was like what if he just is a player and he was like for the first time he's like i can hook up with human girls and so that was exactly why they had to be brother and sister because I mean, he was the one who insisted on it it sure does seem that way but like okay first off i wanted to say that the word cardian is used across all versions yep. yeah the twin thing yeah is this what's it so i believe that is just what they're called and for once that is what they were called in the source material, and it survived through every version. Yep. And there were a couple things that were cut, but they're real small moments, like Artemis Arch gets on Luna. Arch on Luna and Max yeah. yeah. Max and across the face. But yes, there, that part was cut on, like, just getting incredibly wet over Mavaru's pleated pant is also not... Um, she sees... There, I was this in the, in the Japanese, but it probably how faithful this stuff is like she sees his terrible outfit and she was like i need that man carnally i don't remember if she says carnally no and that's probably a joke oh come like, but yeah she sees him and as i said she is h-o-t-o to go oh, gee, yeah Stimply. yeah yeah she i she doesn't say that i was just but she said something like oh that boy, that green jacket those pleated <laughs> she she saw that outfit and just went like Phew. Sold. sold and then she, and then he talks and he's just awful and i'm like gosh what there's also a part where ale is like yes we'll prey on men and women and ale on is like just girls and he's like but 
what's wrong with boys? Like, yeah, he's like, girls, that seems like a waste. Can it be boys? And she's like, you know, she's like, she's like girls. Poor Canelo's dose. He's like, uh, I also have to say, and we'll repeat through all through my notes on this. Ale has game. Ale has made she game. does. Like when he's not being super problematic, he is like very romantic and uh-huh. very forward with his feelings. So another thing that I'm pretty sure that that is in the Japanese that was cut or heavily edited for Deke is the degree to which Usagi is being punished outside of the classroom at the beginning of the episode oh, and yeah. Amy comes and sees her. Uh, like Miss Haruda is like punishing her in a way that perhaps they didn't want to present to their young Western audience. So yes. yeah, there's there's a long scene where Usagi's like being punished outside of the classroom. Ami comes across her. They're having a conversation. Miss Harna comes out in the hall and is like, Ami, don't talk to this horrible slacker. You might get her cooties on you and like dumps water over her head or something. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a lot. Doing the thing that I imagine is probably surreal, like a form of corporal punishment where they have to stand in the hall and hold, but which I presume was a real thing that happens because I'm, re- I'm watching the new Ron Mac. There's about that happening. In- like, and so like she's up there like old and two buckets of water so it's heavy and then they get in the big row and water gets flung onto yeah so i think they didn't want to show school corporal punishment to a western audience and that's probably why they edited that let me see what else i have as notes on the japanese the japanese version when luna does the luna mind melt it's pretty intense in the deke version as well but in the japanese version at least she not only cries when she's receiving all of these horrible traumatic memories, she screams no at one point and very clearly like does not want to fight. But she puts on a brave face and just is like, you know what, Luna, at least I can talk to you again. And then she literally cries again at the end of the episode and says goodbye to her normal life. So, yeah, they, they really lean into the fact that like she just she wanted to she was happy living a normal life and she doesn't enjoy fighting and being sailor moon regardless of whether she's also ooh, a princess and my other note about the japanese is that much like in season one where we had the joys of every yoma yelling refresh in season in in, in r after every yoma dies they yell cleansing and then die for whatever reason. In Japanese, when Alan and Anne, when Ale and An introduce themselves, Ale says that he is a nomad noble of the universe. That they, that, the Vin's version of that line is nomadic noble curse. Same thing. Yep. I, a bunch of that's the same, except pairing anyone else's voice, King Hochinomitsu Yushi, is unfair. So I'm not going to do it. In- I have a note that says Jute's deep dub voice is unmatched. And I am correct. Yes. Over the course of the next couple episodes, you watch it. Over the course of the next couple episodes, Julia has switched her hate from Mamaru to Luna. She was very angry with Luna in this episode. She yelled, You took from her over Luna being like, Should I restore her from that? And the choice was that you have her and Luna, like, there in these episodes, there are several instances, particularly in the Japanese, where Luna is just, like, unprovokedly mean to her again. Did I just imagine she was nice in my chow? Is she more nice during Deke? Yeah, she's, like, the deep dub still has a lot of trash talk. And in the Viz version, she's not quite as nasty. But she's still critical of her horse. Yeah. There was a lot, there are a lot of moments I remember from the deep dub where she's just like, you Saudi, you suck so much. How dare you eat food and breathe. And in the, they like added extra mean stuff to the, the Luna and in Japanese or in the deep dub, dub rather, she just says things like, now's the time for this or whatever. Like there are a couple of places where they made her dialogue meaner instead of her being the straight man in the scene. There are, there are a couple instances where Usagi is doing something completely ridiculous. And... Which is a couple moments like that. And there, that comes funny. She's behaving... But then they, in the deep dead, they made her, like, directly insulting shit a couple places. Yep. Which I'm like, why? Probably because someone thought that was funny. 
That's the best guess. Yeah. All right. Should we go over a couple comments? Unless you sure. guys have anything else yeah. to add. Just take some comments. All right. So some because they've been the comments have been fired today. So Ura coming in saying that used one flute solo at all times in Deke in the Japanese version, it changes. So that's something to look out for coming up. And then Deke Dub didn't he didn't you know, fit the Deke Dub. We're recording this once. Fuck you. One and done. Yeah. Oh. And then Ariel also says the villains being the same age as Usagi is a really nice change from an evil adult queen. It is. I think that the show gains by these being people that they interact with in their civilian guises because it makes it feel less separated from their nighttime heroism. Like, she was never running into Beryl at the mall and getting into squalling into the terror. But okay, bring it. We know that Zoocyte never changed clothes and Kunzite did not do schemes at all. Nephrite had his one outfit and his one disguise and then his five luxury cars in his mansion. So he had some degree of interaction, but his interaction wasn't with like Serena and co. And then Jedi, he had his many delightful disguises, but that was that was the joys of Jay Dite and his various other other disguises okay. were quickly lost once he bit it. But like I look back on it now and I'm like, Jedi, I didn't appreciate you when I had you. Like because there was so much that was like crap about those episodes that we can look back and be like, you know what though? I loved his dumbass schemes. Like I loved how much he tried to like lean into his own bits. Right? Like there's just something about him that I'm just like, you're so silly, go sit down. And his and ability then, to like have his finger on the pulse of culture at all times would have been like his TikTok would have been famous. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent, for sure, for sure. Oh my god, god for that is freeing. At the end, like end of the whole series, Galactia redeems all of all of her, and then Matarno just like gets the forehead boomerang. Yup. It was just out of room. So like, yep. And then you ha her hair a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And then fades to black. And you're like, holy shit, that is a twist. That would be genuinely such a delightful twist. Someone wanted to be in music. Someone write the fans about Beryl actually being in undercover as Miss Haruna. Yes. Him? Yes. Like, they share the personality trait of, like, being single and lonely. Yes. Like, Miss Harna is always, she's always like, I hate being a school teacher because I would really love to find love and I'm always around kids. And Beryl, we know her downfall was how incredibly horny she was. She constantly made bad decisions because of it. Kunzai can tell you. So many, so many. Poor Kunzai could have won it. Easy. Kunzai could have won so many times. Constantly like, man, do not. Man, do not. Or as said, that explains why Fiori is so horny for Darien because these aliens need to go to horny today. Oh, they are definitely from the horniest planet you've ever seen. Like, because instantly uncontrollable levels of horny, both of them. Like, now they, oh. they, they lock on. They are locked into their targets. Like, Alan is in the crowd. He sees Serena, and that is it for him. Like, he's not a player in that he's not going around trying to romance every girl he sees and falling in love with every girl he sees it's specifically serena he yeah. wants her bad and he tells her that and and same thing she sees darian she wants the green jacket the pleated pants like she's ready it's like they're locked in they're instantly so attracted that it makes them incredibly dumb and like they lean in the series creators lean into the idea that it makes them incredibly dumb. Like they're constantly having comedic moments where they could have had such a great villain scheme if they were not like overwhelmingly desperate to like date these people. They want them so bad it makes them look stupid. It genuinely does. Like when you were like these aliens have just discovered sex for the first time, I was like, I know exactly what that note was in reference to. It's in reference to the fact that they go from zero to a hundred on the horny scale. Yeah, I, and I gotta say they're not less horny in the deep depth. 
they can say less, but it doesn't change the energy that they have. And the voice actors really, truly understood sign Oh, yeah. Oh, really yeah. Did. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. And then this one, I'm not 100% sure what Ur is talking about, but said, okay, but can we talk about the Cardian digital scene bumper? That shit went hard. Oh, it's scene bumper, the thing in in between the episode, the I think is what Ur is talking about. I don't, I've never heard that phrase before, so I'm a little bit in the dark. I apologize. No, I don't know. I'm going to guess that's what or, it is. Oh, do you mean like a creative scene wipe? Like, are they like zoom in on a spinning cardi and zoom out and you've done yeah. a scene change? Something like I that? Think that's it. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely awesome. Absolutely fire. I, I love it. anytime there's a creative scene wipe. Oh, so cute. The special Sailor Moons, I think, are iconic. Yeah. The okay. Transition that pops up in the D for Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Yep. Okay. Cool. I I did. Yes. And then it took me a minute to get there because I don't know. I've slept since then. I fully agree. I love when they do that kind of thing. Again, and I also agree. Let Alan be a bisexual disaster. Yes. Yes. Let's see. Anything else in the comments? Oh, okay. Can you read this one? Either of you. K. Araki is voicing Usami because of Kosuma Mitsubishi having appendix removed. He recovers well. Maybe she hasn't come back and oh, she's Oh, she's still doing well. She, she can only have her appendix and... removed once. I hope. Yeah, yeah I hope so. that went well for her. She's not dead, so I just like. Do you know, know she had a second appendix? Well, return until the cherry blossoms picnic at the dead, and she takes this like. Cool. Has no only is she like out for a couple episodes. Can two ADHD people finish one sentence? No, we can. We can. We can, we can have several paragraphs in between, and sometimes if I'm like in the zone, I can keep closing the brackets until we get down to that original one. Yes. Sometimes I need someone else to remember. We've 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 all got each other, and that's a lot. And then we're almost done with the comments, I promise. But I wanted to point out Sailor Denzel said that was so fresh for a kid show, her not wanting to be a hero. Yes. And it's not like it that continues to be relevant for the next few episodes that will become a character moment for her. I really love that they leaned into that. I think it says so much about her as a person and about what her greatest qualities really are, which are just her humanity, her empathy, her compassion which were all things she was fully able to keep doing while she was human. Like her greatest qualities were never her superpowers or her princess-like behavior or anything like that. And it shows in the fact that going back to fighting and having that kind of responsibility didn't make her happy. No, it really made her sad. The only thing she was happy about was getting her friend Luna back. And Luna, to be clear, treats her like shit. But she was still like, oh, Luna, I'm so glad I'm going to you again, right? Isn't that <laughs> Fly, let me get... huh? Fire, I forget. I mean, does anybody, maybe the, even the audience know, how far are we on the Luna Say Something Nice to Serena challenge? She said like two or three nice things so far in we the entire series. still on the hand. Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure we're still on one hand. Yeah, because I know I have documented three times. And we're on season two. Yeah. Just that's, just that's that's just how Luna is. Artemis tried to be like Luna. We should still think about starting a family, and Luna like scratched him across the face. Because this was in the opening scene. There, the cats are on the roof watching the girls lead a normal life, and then they show a clip of like two birds flying together throughout the air. This is implying like a birds and the bees thing. Yeah, and then and then Artemis is like, and maybe you and I should think about settling down and starting a. And then she just swipes him across the face with her claws. And so that's theoretically her boyfriend. And that's how she, that's how he got treated. So this her personality. Eek. Yeah. With that after the F movie when she falls in love with another man. And with the option, she's sweet as candy. Yeah. Shall we move on to the next episode? Sure. Yeah. All right. Monica hit us with the Japanese title. The episode title for episode 48 in Japanese is For Love and Justice, Sailor Guardians Once Again. What's going to happen? Michi, what do we got? So you want to be in pictures? So you want to be in pictures, kid? Ryan Lloyd Betts, I heard in Molly's accent. 
That was me trying to be Molly, which is horrible. Molly's in this one. He's almost in. Like, there's, oh my God, Ura, real quick. In her species, relationships are normal here. Luna is a human, and Chibi should date the horse. It's fine. Oh, 100%. 100%. Like, the, like Chibi Usa, her, ro- her main romantic interests are a horse priest and a fairy child. She's not super into humans. And then, of course, Hotaru, her girlfriend. Uh, yes. Molly came up with this. Just... <laughs> At the beginning of the episode, Serena, who now has her memories back, sees Darian on the street, so instantly tries to be like lovey-dovey with him. She grabs his arm. She's like, oh, Darian, my darling, I'm so happy to see you. He doesn't have his memories back, so he's like, who the fuck are you? Apparently doesn't even remember that he was bullying this girl the other night when they were standing over a crater. But Anne also sees him and is like, oh, he's so hot. I got to get on that right now. And she approaches Darian is like, these people are crazy. He fucks off. Meanwhile, the cats are talking to each other. They're worried about whether or not they should restore the other inner senshi's memories. And Serena comes in. They're talking to her about it. And Serena's like, no, you don't have to restore their memories. I can handle it myself. They're like, no, I don't know if you can. Meanwhile, the doom tree needs more energy. So they pick another cardian. This one is a minotaur. Um, Studio exec. We cut to the conceit for this one, which is that elsewhere... In a film studio, studio executives have been stalking random schoolgirls in hopes of casting them in a TV show. Namely, all the schoolgirls we know. So they have, like, creeper footage of, like, Ami, Rei, Minako, uh, Makoto, and Naru. Sorry. Amy, Rei, Lita, Mina, and Molly. And they're like, we should cast her. No, we should cast her. Let's call them in for an audition. Alan and Anne, as aliens appear... They knock out all of the execs and they're like, we can use them as puppets. All of the girls that had been stalked by the execs do, in fact, all get called in for an audition, but it's an evil audition. It's Molly plus the other inners other than Serena. She wasn't called. Amy does show up for the audition, but she says she's literally only there to turn them down. When they get into the audition, Alan and Anne are on a weird, very extensive alien set piece that has like crumbling pillars. They make a comment that this is what their world looks like now. Their Cardian Minotaur attacks all of the girls, but Anne thinks that Alan is being too dramatic about it and fucks off to get her own energy. She and Serena run into Darian, who works there. They chase him. They get separated. Meanwhile, Luna happens on the girls who are now under attack. They fight even though they have no powers, and Luna's like, they're so impressive. Even though they have no powers, they're doing their best because she can say nice things about anyone as long as they're not Serena. Serena returns, sees what's going on, she henshins. She then tries to summon the Crescent Moon Wand to do moon healing activation, but she then remembers that she no longer has the Crescent Moon Wand, and so she can't use that. Luna, meanwhile, mind melds with the other girls. They get their memories back. They henshin. The other girls kill the Yoma without Sailor Moon, and then Luna says something mean about Sailor Moon again. And that's the episode did like these episodes have an opportunity for someone other than Sailor Moon to finish the job. Yes, and it happens multiple times, which is great. Because they don't have to they don't have to turn anyone back human. We just kill they can just kill him. Yeah. Like with their own attacks. Yeah. See Return of the Mind Meld. That's one of my notes. I have another note that says how does any of this work? Don't worry. No, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'd be executives. Scouting talent by stalking underage women is never explained. Not a new version. No. Uh, that's just a thing that happens, and we're supposed to not worry. Don't worry about it. I'm go with that. Fine. It could just happen. Yeah. Uh, not creepy. Like, first note just says, these doom aliens. They do. They didn't need to do any of this. They didn't need a scheme to select a bunch of girls and bring them to a set to do any of this. Their very first energy drain was just they sent out a monster and found a human It started taking energy. But for some reason, they try to have schemes. Their schemes are all dumb and irrelevant. But their choice... Let's see. I have a note. It's a fun little note in the Japanese. So in an early scene where the cats are, like, thinking about whether or not to restore the girls' memories, then uh, Usagi comes in and she's like, what are you talking about? And they're like, whether or not we should restore the other girls' memories. They don't say the other girls. They specifically say 
we were thinking about restoring Ray and Ami's memories. So it's not like, like in Japanese, you'll often have like Ray Santachi, where it's like Ray and everybody's there. Like they have, but there's a convention as best I understand it without having studied Japanese. But in Japanese, sometimes when you're saying a group of people, you say one person and then Tachi, which means like that person and everybody. But they didn't say Ami Santachi or Ray Santachi. They specifically said Ray and Ami because I listened back to it. And so I'm like, were they initially thinking that like they were like, let's just get two of them. But just, just, just two. Let's we just, we just pick up two. It was just a weird little dialogue decision that, again, maybe because I don't speak Japanese, it was more mundane than I am reading it to be. But to me, it, it felt notable that they were talking about specifically just Ray and Ami. Yeah. I don't know how the... I'm not sure how the deep dub France, like, is dub... Because I don't have a note. So whatever you noticed didn't jump. Yeah, they, 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 they know have just, in fact, yeah, have been a, the way that the Japanese present language groups of people differently. I want to say oh, no. all the outfits in this episode are fired. Yeah, everyone looked at Oh, yeah. Okay. It was, uh, this was one of the stronger animation teams, and they got some of the better outfits. Absolutely great looks for the gang. Yeah. Let's see. Is there anything else in Mark? Can we mention Arad, about this? Okay. I had to say, I feel like the Cardian designs are leveled up and horny compared to the Yoma. Like the Minotaur is probably someone's furry awakening. We're gonna talk about a furry short. Yeah, yeah. There there's some furries going on. And we will get to one in the next episode. Oh. As I believe. All right. Let me see if I have anything else that was notable about this episode. I did like um, that Molly was still involved. Yeah, Molly continues to have somewhat of a presence, uh, particularly in the Doomtree arc. I think so. That is because you have villains that are at school with oh. with Serena. There's more of a focus on the school life and therefore more room to have Molly continue to be a presence. Uh, I think that's what leads to that. But I love it. I think it's great. We we stand Molly. We love a Molly. In in the Viz dub, Molly has a very genre savvy moment where before she goes with everyone to this mystery audition, she's like, so every time I go to one of these black like, mystery auditions, something bad happens. She's a Jusagi. She's like, every time I go to one of these, something bad. She hasn't said like, I wake up half out in the middle of nowhere, fuzzy headed. And no full recollection of what happens. Uh, but she's like, this is going to get weird, isn't it? And we're like, so cute. what do you mean? But, mm -hmm. but she does bring Usagi with her as a result. Yes, she does bring Usagi with her as a Which, again, is uh, very smart of her. That she saved her bacon. Just, just Naruti and Rilds, I would love for more of Naruti and Genre Savvy. Actually, oh, this know. whole thing. Like, I would really <laughs> like her to get wiser and wiser until at some point it's like, I have to tell her it. No. It's like, and Newsom's like, right? He's very started, right? Like, and Newsom's like, it's month. Right. Because, like, we already know that Naru knows that she lives in a world of magic and good versus evil because she was literally in love with, like, in, in the evil spaceman from the Negaverse. And he died by being stabbed with giant vines. He bled green blood. And then dissolved into sparkles in her arms. Her knows that she lives in a magical world. So it makes sense that when weird shit happens and shit always gets weird, she would think, just because I live in a magical world and there probably is magical shit happening. Yeah, not to mention that like, Ray regularly uses magic because she's the living. Yeah. So we know at least that in this world, being a suitable amount of Shinto, does she promise? Yes. And being religious does, in fact, give you special abilities. Yes. Uh, which do come up a whole bunch, too, in this in this set of episodes. Why? Ray, uh, Ray performs a collect to some degree of Like, yeah. yeah. Is that it works. Like, yeah. In this episode, obviously, they don't know yet that they're senshi, but they fight anyway. Jupiter, as usual, just chucking people over and monsters over her shoulder. 
But Ray, not only, as Ura points out, does some purse foo with her Gucci bag. Uh, she just flouts the purse and is like, let's go. But also, again, uses a Kuryo Taisan with her, her charm to, to attack the Yoma. Yeah, and that is something she will continue to do. She's going to be reading the flames at the temple in the, ne- in the next few episodes. Yeah, she has just genuine magical powers from her religious faith. And I do agree. Ray's bag was designer. Like, there's no way oh, that it was not. For sure. Oh, for sure. Oh, hundred percent. Girl is living that life. Yeah. 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 I love how Ray is a Catholic schoolgirl using Buddhist rituals while living in a Shinto. <laughs> <laughs> Does he? When you have three religions, then you get superpowers. That's how it worked. These are the rules, huh? If you grew up in a household that celebrated two major religions, you just get a third one and then you get superpowers. Oh, I just need one more. Yeah. Uh, right. Esoteric Buddhism. And then. All right. Go for it. Sheer yeah. for it. Yeah. What other notes do I have for this episode? I really loved that Naru part. That really did it for me. She was, she was like, I, my note was like, Naru, Naru is suddenly like this collection that plot. It's true, though. It's true. Oh. The monster is called Minotauron, and once again, we sure did pay a woman to say that word over and over again. Over and over over again. I was just going to say, at least in the Deke, I know that, because initially when we were watching these episodes in the Deke, you were like, aren't these the Yoma that can only say their names repeatedly like Pokemon? And there's at least one that we encountered that can say other stuff. So other Yoma, like other Cardians either are of lesser intelligence and can only say their names or only like saying their names. Yeah, they just might choose it. This is one of the places where I wish that the dub had been a little less faithful. I would have been perfectly happy with paying a voice actor to make noises instead. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like that's, I understand that the name repetition thing is like a Japanese monster show thing. Like, I think it's from... Like yeah, 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 that sort of thing, and the related, and things that are related or inspired by Tokusatsu. The yes, the, the Ura pointed out the the in the dub Cardians of Speech. Oh, is it in all the dub? Because the first five episodes I watched, they sure do have someone saying the monster name over and over. Maybe they stop that after a while because they realize it's weird, or at least uh, I don't want to like. I know that's a thing in other Japanese media, so I don't want to be like this cultural thing that they did is stupid. For a Western audience, it doesn't land. Like, we don't have the context for enjoying that or having nostalgia for it or, like, whatever other feeling. I'm sure it annoys Japanese, but whatever other feeling that you would have towards it, where, like, even a Japanese person might be annoyed because they're like, man, that's a genre thing they don't. Right, yep. For an English-speaking audience, we don't have that context. So we're like, why are you doing this? And that's a case where, like, the localization could have done without it. It doesn't mean anything to an English-speaking audience. Right. Yep. Yeah. You think it, that's often the reason that I think that neither the deep dub nor the viz dub fully satisfy how I would have wanted a localization of Sailor Moon to be. One of them is far too, let's say, reinterpreted. And one of them is too directly literally translated from the Japanese without a sense of how to localize something culturally without disrespecting the audience's intelligence. Do I have other notes? Oh, I have another note that says they're so bad at this. A Julia yelled, use your pen at Usagi when she's trying to figure out how to sneak in and they're like Yeah. Um, yeah. Julia yelled use your pen. Yeah. Oh, that was like a perfect opportunity for a new disguise. Where did her disguise pen you forget about? Sorry. Uh, Luna put it in a drawer and forgot about it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, here's also where I have my note that Julian has traded hating Mama for hating Luna. She was really bad at Luna in this episode, too. The, the Fire Soul Crest beam voice acting in the Viz dub, thumbs down, given that one I didn't like it. Yeah, yeah, I didn't think it landed as well as it did in either the Japanese or... This is actually a case where some of the quality of the voice acting itself, not the lines, but the voice acting, stood out to me. All right. So what's our next episode title? Okay. Episode 49 of Japanese is titled, For Whom is the White Rose? Question mark. 
the Moonlight Knight appears. Once again, what happens in this episode? It is. Oh. Although, like, I will argue this is le- that, although that is a thing that happens in the episode, it is by far not the crux of the episode, interestingly. No, not at all. What's our English title? Freaking love this set of titles, except for one coming up. But this one is A Night to Remember, but it's a night like a night. Like a uh-huh. spelled, that, spelled with a K. That one, so that works. Yes, it is. That is the episode era. That works both as a reference to, like, that is a fantastic title because we're dealing with the reference to Moonlight Knight, who we're going to meet, and the fact that we have this issue of Mamo not having his memories. So memory is thematic to what's going on with the Moonlight Knight. But also, we're dealing with Jupiter's flashbacks, her own memories of the person who has been the knight in Shining Arbor in her life and how how she thinks back on and remembers her life with him. Like, I think, honestly, what a spot on title that's perhaps one of their most encapsulating titles that Deke has ever done. And I love the Deke titles. They're delightful. But I really like that one. Right? Like, there's something about it that I'm just like, Yes, 11 out of 10. Keep going. Absolute banger. Yep. Absolute. The, um, All right. The, yeah. the last couple Zeke dub titles. My camera stopped detecting. Yeah, now your less good camera has also given up the ghost. I'm worried. <laughs> We're only two episodes in. How many more cameras um, do you have left? One three times a day. Unfortunately, that's none. All right. So let me hit you guys with the description, the summary of this episode. We open in Medius Red, a Pink y- lion yomo with boobies is attacking. In Japanese, his name is Shinozaki. In Deke, his name is Ken. We we stand Ken. Lita saves him from the Cardian, but he's in bad shape. He like gets ambulanced off to the hospital. He needs a blood transfusion. They're like, we need typo. Lita's like, take mine. I'm typo. It's very intense. They take her to the hospital. She's like laying in the bed next to him, literally being transfused. She talks about how, like, he was always there for her. She remembers, like, a time when she was getting dumped by a shitty guy who left her in the rain. And then Ken showed up with an umbrella and sheltered her from the rain. And she says, like, he's more than a boyfriend to her. Serene is very motivated by how touching their relationship is. So when she goes home from the hospital, she starts drawing all these little pictures of her past life with Prince Darian. The next day, the or... The next day-ish, the girls have another Sailor Scout meeting. Lita is pissed because of what happened with Ken. She wants to kick the new enemy's ass. Like, she is just not controlling her temper about this. She is emotionally compromised. Serena is running late to the meeting. In the meanwhile, she runs into Darian and Anne on the street. She immediately pulls out the little cute little drawings that she had done and is showing them to Darian to try and restore his memory. Anne mocks her for this because she thinks her drawings are really bad. But when Serena looks up, Darian is just gone. He is fucked off. But Alan shows up with roses for her and professes his love. She gets very flustered by this and then runs off. He comments to himself that just makes him more hot for her. Meanwhile, back at the meeting, Ray looks into the fire and she sees the lion cardian. Lita gets pissed all over again. They all hench in and run off to battle the cardian. Uh, they run into Serena on the way. She henshins. Oh, as they're running to the site of the battle, Jupiter, like, nearly collapses. She's exhausted because of her recent blood donation. Sailor Moon tries to stop her from fighting. She's like, go home. You just gave all that blood. Like, you're not going to do well if this happens. But Jupiter insists. She's just still too pissed. They see the Cardi and Jupiter instantly rushes into battle. She gets completely slammed by the pink lion yoma with boobies the other girls cover her with their attacks but the all the girls are on their rope on the ropes and then a a white rose appears and a mysterious man in let's say white desert themed garb makes an inspirational speech he's introduces himself as the moonlight knight he chucks a sword at the yoma and then fucks off jupiter wakes up and sees that the lion yoma is or lion cardian is now attacking sailor moon She gets pissed all over again and zaps the lion to oblivion, saving the day. The next we see them, Ken is finally being discharged from the hospital. The girls ask whether Lita is going to go to his, like, welcome home party, and she says no, she's going to hang back. Ken's always watched over her. 
Uh, cause she says, since Ken has always watched over her today, she's going to watch over him. And that's basically the episode. All right. The Moonlight Knight is the best version of this man. Yes. If we're setting aside the cultural appropriation yes, of the that, we, 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 must, we must acknowledge that it cannot go unsaid that this is very culturally appropriative to dress him this way. But if we set that aside, he is otherwise superior to Tuxedo Mask. So superior. Welcome back. Welcome Hello. I made it back. Apparently, I just had to restart the stream. But you know what? You're back. It's yeah, only like, turned it off and turned it back off and on again. The classic. It, uh, the, the classic, yeah. That's the classic fix. 99% of the time it works. All I'm right. Still... So let's talk about, do we want to talk about Rainy Day Man? No, oh, we need to talk about Rainy Day Man. I'm his shoulder. I cry. When my first, fl- first brush with love left me shaking inside, like, it's so good. It's, and I think what's impressive about the Deke songs is that some of the other like I'm sure that I watched like the finale episodes of the first season and the Silver Crystal episode where my only love plays I'm sure I watched those episodes a billion times so it's unsurprising that I would have those songs memorized back to front I probably haven't watched A Night to Remember that many times but I could do Rainy Day Man start to finish every lyric without fail and i think that's a sign of a song that is like sufficiently catchy with lyrics that are not so simple as to be stupid but also not so complex as to be difficult for a young kid to latch on to yeah it's just a banger by bob yeah it might have been it might be the music kitchen people Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it might still, not be like, Bob, but still, like... But the people also responsible for my only love, so, like... Yeah, like, well, I have just it crushed it every time. And, it's like, they didn't have to go... Oh, go ahead, yeah, tell us who... I was just going to say, it was composed by Michael... The ben- pronunciation face. Bang Hyatt? Bang Hyatt. I'm okay. sorry if I pronounce it wrong. I'm you trying my best. You made effort, and that's what matters. Yes, and then also composed by Lois Leish. Leish. Leish? We'll go with Leish. And then lyricists were by Michael Benhet, ben- ben- again, and Lois Leish, and then singer was Patricia Tolet. All right, good job, Michael, Lois, and Pat- Patricia. You Amazing. crushed it. I think this is, this song is a little bit more unusual in terms of the Deke songs, especially in that, a lot of the other Deke songs are capstone songs for those very pivotal Sailor Moon-centric plot moments. And this is just like an emotional song specifically about Lita. It's delightful. I absolutely love it. What a banger. Obviously, the original Japanese did also have a song in that part of the episode. So it's not like it was a Deke idea to come up with a song to put there. But nonetheless, they crushed it. Yes. And... I was going to say, it's just like perfect song. And then like, as Ursa said, the Ken, the best boy, Ken of all green flags. Like, what an amazing guy. And so, yeah, the main thing that I want to talk about in terms of the major difference in how the Japanese episode presents this story is that at multiple points in the Japanese episode, They go out of their way to explain that this is explicitly a non-romantic and yet incredibly emotionally deep relationship between Makoto and Shinozaki Ken. They, in the hospital, Usagi basically asks, is she, is he your boyfriend then? And Makoto says, no, it's not quite like that. I love him more deeply than I could ever love a boyfriend. And then at the end of the episode, Usagi specifically has a moment where she consciously contemplates the fact that their relationship is not romantic and like contemplates, is it even like, I didn't realize it was possible for a boy and a girl to have a deep relationship that wasn't romantic. And as much as I'm like, oh, let Jupiter have a boyfriend at the same time. I love that they chose to convey 
this deeply held relationship, especially between a man and a woman, that is not romantic, but is not lesser than a romantic relationship, you genuinely still nowadays don't see that a lot on TV. It's not terribly common. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. That's, it's a lovely moment. I think she, she says like, she basically says that he's better than a boyfriend because he's not romantically in they have a, be- a stronger bond. And then she also says that she was, he was always there for her when she was dumped for the umpty five. And I'm like, girl, you're 14. Yep. What do you do? I just, I just, I just mad left and right. But I also <laughs> don't understand how she keeps getting dumped. Like, what's lacking in her? Who are these men that she's trying to get? Eighth graders. Yeah. Again, yeah, then. Like, I just, I was then, I then just imagined the kind of kid that is. Like, she's got a new boyfriend every two weeks because they're 13, they're eighth graders. Like, this is they're this tumultuous emotional relationship that left her scar involves some hand holding behind the school on Friday. Like, if you, like, they can't go anywhere. The kid, like, I just, I don't know, it just gave me a lot of affection for middle schoolers. And, 100%. And, like, the, they can't help but be that overwhelmed by emotion because they're 13. Like, the hand-holding behind the school is the most important thing in the world to them. They're little. Because it's the strongest uh, emotion they've felt so far. Yeah. 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 You're just thinking about jupes in that context, just like a dear reader. I like the Sailor Moon characters both for being these iconic, heroic characters and also for being kin. Yep. For being wonderfully human. Yeah. Also, can we just point out that the voice acting for Susan Roman as Sailor Jupiter is just like top tier. This episode, yeah, I'm like, oh my Jesus. god, no flaws, no flaws. Like genuinely, for till my dying day, when people are like, "What are some of the best voice casting that's ever been done in anything for anything?" I will be like, "It was Sailor Jupiter in the deep dub." Like her voice is so specific, iconic perfect for the character and the acting is always well delivered like she manages to give it a lot of emotion but also fit the cartoon size of every moment just oh she's phenomenal so good. i'm with everyone who was disappointed that she didn't get to d jupiter in ages yeah yeah i just it, what a letdown she's just so good because we know for a fact she would have came back she said so in the book all right, so let's see. Let me see what other... Monica, what other comments do you have on this episode? Let's see. What other comments do I have on this episode? My handwriting for this one is really bad. You were having, you were having, you were having a month. It's valid. I was having a month. Yeah. Oh, that's the wrong episode. I was like, the fire soul combo? That wasn't in this one. We'll see where that firing going. Or maybe. Is it you? That's yeah. you. Is it? There they went. They're gone now. No, it's still going. Or can you no longer hear it? Oh, it's faded. Okay. I'm like, it's still going. It crescendoed and then it decrescendoed. Yeah, well, I can that. Okay. Lion. The name of the monster is the lion, which the, they spelled with a PH, and they sure did pay someone to... This was the one that put it over for me. I was just like, I'm so tired of hearing this person. <laughs> Content warning. This one's annoying. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, flashing lights warning. Oh, yeah. And I think you yeah. mentioned that unfortunately after the fact in the because we didn't know that it was coming in the patreon yeah version. um so, yeah flashing like patreon warning yeah be advised for this episode on does not have any game nope on no, has no negative game she is rizless i have come on the range episode episode i'm inserting that clip for youtube because i fucking love the on the range clip in japanese I wasn't paying no. close enough attention because I was taking notes. Is she singing one of the Sailor Moon theme songs? Because it's might... definitely not Home on the Range. I'm, I feel like she's singing the lyrics to one of the Sailor Moon, which is not the first time they've done that. It's delightful anytime they have characters, like they play a little bit. They play with diegesis of having the characters in universe know the theme song of the show that they're in. And I feel like that's what they did here, but I don't remember. And I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't fast enough to catch it. I have another note that says Mako has an un- it's unforgivable moment and it goes really hard. And that was yeah. even in the Viz dub. I was like, yeah. this is even better in Jack. Yep. 
this was the horny animation team, and you can tell by the Cardian. He took a lion, made it pink, and then slapped some boobies some on it. Titties on it. Yeah. That's it. That's the whole thing. It's a pink lion with tits. Yep. And you've seen better pink lions with tits on any furry art website. 100%. You don't have to tune in for this one if you really pink lion. No. Just, yeah, just, go- just Google that. If, yeah. Can, and you're, you'll OP. find something essentially. If um, I was to sure that if that is a thing you're trying to find, to find to yeah, find. I'm creeped by assumption. You find this what you ass- want. Yeah, this is my assumption that if you're googling "can't lie with tits," just that's what you want. Because that's what you want. Yeah, exactly. That's what you want to look at. Yeah. Um, t- I have a note about the geek dub that says Terry Hawks's incredible and incredible ad libs monologue. I don't remember. She has a monologue that she, that she very clearly to me was making up that she was going along. Um, and it's delightful. I love Terry Hawks. Yeah, I'm uh, so much. I don't remember what monologue that might have been. I want to hope that it was her relating the backstory of the Moon Kingdom and Prince and Demi yeah. and to Darian, because I would love the idea that's what she was ad libbing, but I don't remember. You'll have to watch Patreon and find out what I'm talking about. Go watch it there and maybe hit up the buck. Oh, but Eric, great session. Go, go ahead. No, go ahead. Be calm. I was just going to do you watch this one for he's all green flags, all green flags. Like, and there's not too many people who can stand up there with with Andrew. Yeah, but Ken absolutely can. What a guy. There was blood in this episode. This left the deep dub rather left the blood in and mm-hmm. being rushed to the hospital part and then cut the parts where you can see that Jupiter's getting a blood transfusion. Yes. Yeah, so she's just laying in the hospital. hospital. Yeah. She's That's just I was like, wait, hang on. I don't recall seeing like that she has the needle in her arm and right there's like a little red tube but she's actively giving blood so they left the part in where the child gets seriously injured but they cut the part that might actually make a kid less scared yes yep they did they did like, like i feel like seeing someone as brave as sailor jupiter get a blood transfusion would be Soothing if you were a kid who had to get a blood drain. Yeah. 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 Or God forbid get Yes. Get blood, blood drawn for tests or whatever. Right. Yeah. Any of those things that could really help make you feel brave. Okay. They for all of it's like Sailor Moon says whatever, they left out the part where like the kid could feel more comfortable by seeing a character who blood. Way to go, guys. Way to go. Yep. And, and unfortunately, that's the part where um, Mako is like a boyfriend, like he's better than a deeper bond. And that's not in the deep. Yeah, they trim a lot of that down. They explicitly get rid of the complexity of their relationship. We do, however, then get Rainy Day Man, and that makes it so. Rainy Day Man does make up for it. It's so good. So I have a note in here about the Japanese version, which is that the dialogue was very touching in, as I said, as they're running off to battle, Jupiter nearly collapses and Sailor Moon tries to convince her to just go home and not fight. And in Japanese, she says, I know I'm always slow and run away all the time, but today I'm going to do my best and cover for you. So please, Jupiter, you'll die. Like She's like, I will work harder, even though I'm a coward, to pick up your role so that you can go home i don't want you to die like she's it is one of the classic like moments that show you what makes her someone that all the other characters love so much that as much as she's presented offhand and comically as flaky and unaware she's very aware none of the other girls even noticed that jupiter had collapsed much less tried to get her to go home and not be in danger now on the flip side of this, you might think that Jupiter having all of these moments where she's like having trouble controlling her anger as a result of like Ken getting injured or like putting herself into high risk situations as a result of fighting when she's lost a lot of blood. You might think that at some point she would learn a valuable lesson from this, um, but that never happens. Uh, at no point does this come back to bite her in the ass. Uh, that her wanting to be extra angry and kick the Oma's ass results in her ultimately being extra angry and kicking the Oma's ass at the end. 
So no lesson was learned about uh, taking it easy and pacing yourself when you're still in recovery. Uh, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. They were like, not, nah, not the time for this. You said two ones, which is to kick some ass. To kick some ass. Yep. All right. Shall we take our break? Or do you yeah, have to break? Yeah. Nope. That's, great that's break. basically all I had to say. And it's a dirty on the dot. Perfect. Perfect. And how long do we want the break? Five minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Sorry. Ten yeah, minutes. We'll come back yeah. at 840. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll be back at 840. I'll put on the tunes for everybody. And we'll see you in a few minutes. Yep. All right, and we're back for the second half of Sailor Moon Deep Dub Season 2, Episodes 41 through 45 Discussion. Hi, everybody. We're going to talk more about some episodes. Let's do it. Yeah, and this probably has, like, the shitty, or, like, the worst title, I think, in all of Deek. Uh, it's got a terrible title in Japanese, too. Let's do it. What's our Deek title? Let's start with that one. VR Madness. VR Madness? I've never okay. heard of more 90s. <laughs> Right, but it's fine compared to the Japanese title, which is... And now for something completely different. Body crisis, colon, the tiara stops work. Like, they didn't try to be elegant or poetic with it all at all. They were nope. just like, this fucking tiara stopped working. The, the summary of the problem in the episode. Guess what happens in this episode, friends? Does what it says on the tin, as the usual. Tiara stopped work. Tiara stopped working. Ready. All right. Oh, I have to sneeze. Listen. Okay. Pineapple. Or whatever it is. Use the right into not sneezing. Success. We found Successfully. All right. Opening of the episode. The tree needs energy again. We are reminded that if it dies, the aliens will die. The stakes have been established. Then Alan has found an ad for a new, like, the place that does a VR experience. And they decide for some reason to use that for energy harvesting. Again, there's it's ne they've never established why they need a pretext to harvest people's energy. Because it's not like in the original where they were like, we need to elevate their energy first so that we could harvest it. They're just like, oh, yeah, we should go there and steal energy. But anyway, apparently the new VR experience place is very popular. Everybody's there to, to try it. Serena shows up. She's by herself with Luna, but she sees Darian and she decides to team up with him because she still wants to make him fall in love with her. Unfortunately, Anne also sees him, also claims him for her partner, which is very awkward. But then Alan is also there. He sees Serena. He joins in to spend time with Serena. The girls are also elsewhere in line. Serena sees that her dad and Sammy are also there. In the course of the VR experience, Alan and Darian get very competitive with each other, which is definitely not Hi, honey. Oh, look at you climbing on the chair. No, oh, he's like, I'm the star now. He is a star. Look at him. So beautiful. He's like, I'm not being flashy because I'm not looking at the camera. I'm not looking. I just happen to be here. Yeah, he's total like, nonchalant. Huh, huh? You're wonderful. Okay. I was successfully distracted. Okay, so they're in the VR experience. Alan and Darian's competitiveness definitely has nothing to do with the girls whatsoever. Nothing to do with it. It's definitely not because, like, Alan is really jealous that Anne really wants to get into Darian's pants or that Serena is so impressed by Darian. Like, it has nothing to do with that. Serena is very bad at the VR experience. Alan and Anne go off and summon a new Cardian to do the thing they actually came here to do. Meanwhile, Serena is now having a great time with Darian, who's doing all the work, but is running around with her. She has a classic fantasy scene of Serena has two hands, but she's upgraded from Tuxedo Mask and, and Andrew to Tuxedo Mask and Moonlight Night, which is delightful. They run into Sammy, who's like, dad's in danger. He drags Darian off to help fight the Cardian. Kenji Papa also uses a fire extinguisher to try and fight it, but all three of the boys get caught because they're just normies. Sailor Moon comes to their rescue. She tries to use her tiara, as was presaged by the title of the episode, the tiara stops working. <laughs> Luckily, Moonlight Night appears. This is interesting because Derek is also there, so they can't be the same guy. He attacks the Cardian with his sword, but then he gets caught. The other girls come to the rescue. They kill the Cardian. And at the end of the episode, Serena's just stressed about everything. That's the episode. 
the episode. So as I was taking my, because I, I take notes as I'm watching the episode so that I can give these summaries. And what I found myself doing, which really pointed to me about a difference in the structure of the episodes in this arc, is that I started not taking notes on everything that was happening because a lot of the stuff that was happening was interpersonal. I was like, I don't necessarily need to give that in my episode summary. So it, it probably sounds from this episode summary that a lot of things happened at a rapid clip and just didn't really, nothing happened and the next thing was occurring. That's because in these episodes, because they have this integration of the villains into the mundane occurrences, there's a lot more that's happening in terms of people's interpersonal relationships in these episodes. The result is that my summaries are shorter, but the episodes are a lot more focused on people's interactions and people's relationships than they were in the first season, which is fun. Yeah, a lot of these episodes are like, they went to go, there. there is a scheme that doesn't need to be a scheme, and because it doesn't need to be a scheme, everyone winds up in the same place at the same time, and they, of course, recognize their predators because it's a scheme, and it doesn't <laughs> hijinks ensue and that's this whole yes, and uh, we do we do they are so stupid yep. uh, that is for our entertainment yes yep yes and it's it's successful it's successful it is hilarious to watch all of the dumb shit that happens and all the dumb shit that people do and say like it's Boy, it's, it's a lot of dumb shit oh yeah oh yeah so but like if you if you go in and you're like oh yeah this is gonna be a bunch of teenage buffoons Doing teenage buffoonery at each other is delightful. And can we also talk about the outfits of the of this episode? Because, like, let's see if I can share this. Like, look at this. Oh, so, like, yeah. She made me that, think lime green and magenta went together. They don't. That particular lime green and magenta don't not go together. Bro, uh, I used a similar color scheme on a character once uh, a couple decades ago. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, that's the color scheme that I used for Zervan. How nice. But but like it's also in real life. I'm not necessarily pulling out a lime green shirt and being like, where's my magenta bottoms to go with it? So she was very daring in her fashion. She was. Whereas he, of course, even though he was going to a VR experience, he still wore his mock turtleneck and his pleated khakis. Apparently, people just throw themselves at him. This is a pleated pants. Uh, yeah, apparently, those pleated pants bring all the girls to the yard. Just had to bring that up because I was laughing at that. Let's see. Oh, right by a window. Any notes about this episode, Monica? Of course, I have notes about this episode. I have notes about every episode. So this is, I have fewer notes on this one because I was just like, I'm tired. Point. This episode is not a good. Well, it moves the plot forward in several ways, but it wouldn't say it's a good episode. Not a good episode. Let's see. I have a note that says this is entirely Ann and Alan's foreplay. Yep. I would like that PVE lays tag they're playing to be real. Yeah. I would enjoy a PVE laser tag. I would like to do that with my friend. There's a, a cameo of the priest Yoba. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. They have all these like 3D monsters in the VR experience. And one of them is definitely the priest Yoma from season one. Yep. Yep. I have a note that says nothing like running into your dad while trying to get it with the world's shittiest dude. It's it's just, just... Kenji Papa was participating in some deep trash talk. Go. That was just very fun. I'll watch that on Patreon for no reason other than this. Yep. The monster's name is Hellant. The monster's name is Hellant. Tell it. Yep. Yep. Uh, I really say there. They, uh, well, but the, the way that the monster says their name is to say the word ant over, and they shirted rational to say the word Burn. flashing light warning. Oh, yep. Good call. Why don't you flash it? Yeah, yeah, you have, you have seizures. Maybe you skip this one. It's not very. Yes. Can you skip it? Skip it. You skip it. This one needs to tip. Let's see. Yeah, dead. That's I think that's the end of my own. So the last note I have just literally does say someone paid this woman to say the word over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah. There's not. There was not a lot. 
Can we talk about the Yoma design or the Cardian design? Yeah. Like a picture of picture? it. I, 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 do, I do like. Yeah. It is horny, but good. I like it the old dragonfly thingy. Very mm-hmm. horny. Yeah. The dragonfly tiara is cool. I'm, I'm, I've got to be honest with you. I got so distracted by her stupid face and the little light thing on her forehead that I missed the fact she's basically naked if her tits are out. Yeah. Fiends? Oh, yeah, I didn't. I was too just by that. Right, yeah. They put a big old dragonfly on her face, which is great. Um, so the same color scheme as what Usagi is wearing. She's got the lime green and the, and the fuchsia. True. Yeah. Maybe they, like, somehow they reflect Usagi. Usagi. Oh, I just had to kiss the Sailor Denzel and Ura were both talking about this design. Sailor Denzel was also you pointed. It <laughs> Uro was distracted in the other direction. And that's the magic of Sailor Moon, everybody. All right. A delightful note about this episode. Kenji Papa, when he tries to fight, he grabs a fire extinguisher, which is wonderfully resourceful of him, and tries to fill the area with smoke, which means that he has done about as much as Sailor Mercury does. Uh, so it's a good thing. It's a good thought. It's a good strategy. Unfortunately, the Cardian does immediately kick his ass, though. Um, oh yeah, but he he tried, and I thought it was I thought it was a clever attempt to contribute on his part. He's so brave. He's a good dad. Oh, in the episode when Kenji Papa and and Sammy are under attack, Sammy runs off to find Serena and Darian, and he runs off with Darian. He's like, "You stay here. I'm a man, and I've got a man to help me." And Serena is hanging back, like, "Who does he think? Who does he think I am?" hero like she is the only superpowered person in this scenario but because of sexism he's not aware that he grabbed the wrong person to help it's a delightful little moment i liked that too and we get to see kenji papa be real brave on the attic his thing yeah for the second time i i had said it when we were watching the deep it's funny that none of them are like special effect or really real right and then that joke's in the Yes. Oh, so, of course. Yep. One of them was like, it's a little bit too real. <laughs> right. And oh yeah, Ami gets her DS light, is what yes. Ura said. I don't know. I like him. Right. Anything else about this episode? It's not really that much of a community episode. Her, her tiara starts with soft working, and we learn that the Moonlight Knight and Darian are in the same place. Those are and the, those are the same two things that Usagi is stressed about at the end of the episode. Are why isn't my tiara working? Who is this guy if he's not my true love? Yeah. Oh, real quick, everybody, swing back with me back to our first episode. Okay. The ending. Relia did they cut the hell out of the biz at, or biz? Oh my god! Did they cut the hell out of the Deke episode ending? P.S. That was the weirdest ending. I swear there were parts missing. I would have to go back. The first episode of the season, it ends pretty abruptly, but it ends abruptly on the heavy emotional note of her looking off into the sky and saying, like, farewell to my normal girl life. And I feel like they ended it abruptly so that they could end it on that, like, heavy downbeat note. Yeah, but so yeah, it may not be that they cut it, but because they didn't keep in that meaningful closing line, it then feels like it just lands like a brick. That okay, that might be why. I just wanted to address that because I remember in Patreon, I was wondering if it was different in the Japanese version, but I guess it just lands like a brick. Yeah, I got Sailor Denzel <laughs> cut Ami here than ten dogs on the corner in the middle of battle. She could though; she can multitask. Girl, oh, yeah. Girl. All right. Shall we go to the final episode? Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. What's our Japanese title for this one? Our Japanese title for episode 61 it is A New Transformation Usagi's Power Up. And our deep title? Cherry Blossom Time. Oh. Hey, very confused. It reminded me of the Assassination Classroom title, but I'm like, but it doesn't add up. Besides the fact that there are cherry blossoms. It's such a letdown for Deke. Like, I was expecting a fun little title, like, a very cherry day. Like, anything. Anything. Monster on Cherry Hill. 
Like some give me one of those, give me one of them follies that you guys like. Yeah, they love follies, cherry blossom follies. Like yeah. they could have gone anything fun with it, but just cherry blossom time. That yeah. that's they were tired at this point. Like someone who was doing the pun person was like, "I've had a week. I want to go home. Is cherry blossom time." They were like, no one's going to notice that, oh, I like cherry blues, which they do love blues, so it's fine. They do yes, love blues. Blue. But yeah. cherry blues is a nice little colorful play on words. So I'm yeah. here for cherry blues. They should have gone with that. See, we could do this job. But yeah, a little bit of a letdown from Deke, who normally come in strong with the episode titles. All right, go with me on this conceit, because it will not make sense in Deke or in Japanese or in Viz. The Inners plus Molly plus Miss Haruna plus Anne are all at the Cherry Blossom Festival together. Melvin is also there. He camped out all night so that he could get them a spot. They all brought lunches with them. They're all exchanging their lunches. Meanwhile, Alan is also standing in the trees, stalking them like a weirdo. Alan and Anne summon a Cardian. The Cardian gets, attacks Molly, Melvin, and Miss Harden and takes some energy from them. Doctor's like, oh yeah, it's probably heat stroke. There's been a lot of that today. But Serena's like, their energy was taken. The Cardian comes back. All the other inners get caught except for Sailor Moon, but Sailor Moon's tiara isn't working. So she then also gets caught. She gets forcibly dehensioned when the Cardian crushes her compact. Luna runs in to save her. Luna and Serena get sucked down into a portal for whatever reason. Luna says that Serena can't use her powers because she's still feeling conflicted about having to become a Sailor Scout again and give up her normal life. They then see a vision of Queen Serenity who says that, like, oh, because she really wants to help her friends, she's restored the silver crystal. She gets a new brooch. She has a beautiful new henshin sequence. Uh, so meanwhile, Artemis, who's the last one standing, has been holding off the Cardian on his own. But luckily, Sailor Moon appears, powered up again. She's fighting the Cardian on her own. Moonlight Knight shows up to help her. Then from the sky, Queen Serenity drops the Moon Scepter. Sailor Moon uses Moon Scepter Elimination to destroy the Cardian, and everybody's saved. They all heartfelt say heartfelt thank yous to Sailor Moon. Then Ray decides to be a dick about it for some reason. The end. Yeah, what the hell was that ending? They just have to, like, have Ray and Luna be a real dick to Usagi. Like, the episode where they awa- reawakened the inners, at the end, Ray's, like... Ray's like, you really needed to reawaken us because you can't do this on your own because she's always a dick. And then Luna was like, yeah, she really sucked. Like, just unnecessarily mean when Sailor Moon had volunteered to be like, no, I'll do it by myself so that my friends don't have to go through what I'm going through of losing their normal lives. Luna was just a dick about it. Like, Ray being a dick again, Luna, like, remains a dick. So, yeah, just for no reason, even when Sailor Moon is doing her best and having real character growth, they're just mean to her. So, I they called the monster, I think, Racy? In yeah. The, 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 it's no. Leshy. Like the tree monster. Lava tree monster. It's Leshy. Yep. Well, that's, yeah. Which, when, when the... The Viz dub had someone have someone make that monster say Lashio. you. Oh, now it makes sense. Now it's not. Yeah, I don't know how this, we. This, this is one of those Yoma, like the design feels incredibly specific. Like it's this beautiful woman, but also a cat, but also like some tree stuff. Uh, and if you don't know what the original Japanese name is, you're often left going, what? Why? What? That and that. So this is a classic example of that because this is one of those monster designs that feels so very specific in ways that aren't straightforward when you're watching something in the deep dub. So you guys want to hear a fun fact? Sure. Yeah. So you know in the deep dub when Sailor Moon goes back, bold, and maybe even beautiful? It was a reference to the CBS daytime soap opera. The bold beautiful. and the beautiful. Yeah. I'm like, that's dating myself. I know what that is, but it is. We're, we're old. We're, we're the old, old and the beautiful. We're the old. I decided to give that. Please don't disagree with us in the comments. I was just. Please. My self esteem is so fragile as it is. I was just talking to someone about how, like, Sailor Moon fandom stuff tends to be pretty relaxed, fairly drama free. 
I don't want to say never drama free because the community, but like fairly drama free, not prone to discourse and incredible arguments. And whenever I've done an in person or new fandom event, it's been absolutely lovely. And all of that is because the pillars of the of the Sailor Moon community are middle aged queers. The we're all old. It's, it's a 30-year-old show. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Right. Can't Stop. help it. All right. Let me see. The They hugely changed a scene from Deke to, from Japanese to Deke at the beginning of it where they've all, like Melvin got them a beautiful spot to spread out a blanket and they all bring out the lunches that they've packed. This is actually a quite lengthy and quite extendedly comical scene. In the Japanese, the first part has Rei making fun of Usagi's lunch because she has these rice balls that she's made that, like, are very lumpy and misshapen. They're, there's just rice balls and nothing else. And Usagi's like, at least these are made with love. Unlike you who took shortcuts and you see the lunch that Rei bought is, like, basically McDonald's. You And so they're all talking about each other's lunch. Like, they're all trying each other's lunch. At one point... Usagi is like, oh, and you didn't bring a lunch. And she says, oh, I feed off of energy. And Usagi gives her a look like, what? And she's like, oh, nothing. Which is hilarious. Then Rei is being a dick to Usagi again about her food. And so Usagi picks up a, like a sandwich slice that she'd gotten from someone else. And she puts a long stripe of like super hot sauce on it and goes, oh, this is really good, Rei. You should try this and hands it to Rei. And Ray like eats it, and then like two seconds later, Ray just with fire for streaming out of her mouth says, "Fire spall." Like it's extendedly comical, and they they did not keep most of that for Teach, which is a shame. It it was delightful, and it's nice to see Usagi getting one over on Ray. I really liked the sound mixing on this in the viz dub, which seems like a very weird thing to say. But they, I'm sure I think Japanese is probably very similar, but they did a thing where all of the gags are happening in dialogue over background dialogue of everyone talking. About oh, that's, and, yeah. Yeah. And there's a real good mixing where they time, like the background noise falls into the background when there's a bit happening. But when there's a brief pause between them, you can hear all the overlapping conversations really clearly. And like we, is really fun, but we also talked about how like some of the biz dub voices are a little bit baby, which is one of the things that sort of detracts from the scene. I was like really impressed by how clear all the dialogue was and the sense of like busyness, like the sense of the you've we've all had the experience of being and like private event that you keep having like one on one interaction. It doesn't help with conveying feel like yeah, which is clearly the point. But then all the voices similar so while i was sitting down to write notes um it was hard to tell who was talking right yep that makes, that makes yeah that's really interesting and makes total sense knowing what we know about the the voice casting for viz i'll also say the falling scene was really well done beautifully animated like it's although again i think so much of this episode is semi-nonsensical uh, even in the original Japanese, like if you just accept that stuff is happening for whatever reason, um, a lot of the stuff that happens is cool. Um, like why did a portal open up that Sailor Moon or that Usagi and Luna were falling into? Why did that portal take them into Usagi's mind palace with Queen Serenity? And why did that like like all of that sort of didn't line up with what was happening with Cardian? And then, of course, you had just. Also, Queen Serenity's ghost drops the moon scepter from the sky. That's just a thing that can happen. Yeah, like there was definitely also, even in Japanese, they don't really explain why this group of people is at the Cherry Blossom Festival together. Why did Miss Harana need to chaperone them? Yeah, thank you. Like, and our chaperone. And I was like, oh, so did they, the other kids come along on, a, on like a school trip? Like, But like, so they, in Japanese, Mirako's like, it's really cool that I was able to come along even though I don't go to your school. And then they were like, yeah, Miss Herda, it's really cool that you got permission to be able to chaperone us on this outing, even though it's not a school event. 
But also, like, why is Anne hanging out with them when they're not friends with her? But also, at at one point during the episode, Miss Harna tells them, all right, you have a one-hour free period to enjoy themselves. And they're like, Miss Harna, this is not a school event. We're not in school. And she's like, oh, yeah. So it's very unclear, again, as to why this particular group of seven, like, or seven or eight kids is with Miss Harna at a weekend cherry blossom festival event. It's never clarified why that is the group of people doing it. They just needed it to be those people, so they decided to have it be. Is this the episode where Molly's really mean to Melvin? Uh, yeah, so she's not as mean to him. Indeed, she's quite sweet with him. She's yeah. really mean to him in Japanese for no reason. I think you get the impression with Molly that Melvin's level of sort of TDA mm. makes her uncomfortable mm. and that she never is getting the hint about that. And so she, as a result, is bullyish with him, which is not a great look because he doesn't appreciate it. Like, at one point after he's saying, like, oh, yeah, I camped out all last night so I could get us this great spot. And one of them asks, oh, weren't you cold? And he's like, oh, no, because I got this genius thing. And he's like, shows himself zipped into this, like, sleeping bag. And she's like, that's so ridiculous. Zips it up over his head. And it's just like, all right, girls, let's have lunch now. And he's like, that was so mean. I like, think I rewatched this several in... moments like that. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say I think I rewatched this in Diz, and I remember thinking, "Wow, that was fucking mean." It's she's really mean to him in the original Japanese, and therefore also in the Viz. And I seem to remember her being a lot sweeter with him when they're like exchanging food and stuff in Deke. Melvin was elite. Sailor Denzel points out, "Miss, it would make sense for Miss Harrow to be there if she was Errol." <laughs> Bring it back. Actually, more sense than what is going on here. Why do we need to do an Eternal Moon cast episode now? Miss Haruna is actually Queen Meryl. Okay, but we could, though. We could, though. We could. It'd be fun. Let's see. Do... Oh, her new henshin is, in my opinion, possibly the most beautiful henshin that she gets in all of Sailor Moon. It's a really pretty one. I'm very much a fan. The pink one, right? It's the one where she blah, 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 blah with her hands and that. Pink. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's this one. I love that I knew exactly what yep. you meant, though. Like, without, you could have not said a you word. Knew. You could picture the brooch and then the brooch. You knew. Yeah, it's that one. We all know. Yeah. It's that one. It's, in my opinion, like, perhaps her most beautiful engine sequence. Although right. many of them are gorgeous. Couldn't really remember what the difference was until you were like, and there's cold dragon ornaments. Moments like you know all of the ones. They are truly iconic. Yep. Uh, I forgot that the cutie moon rod makes that noise. I yeah. Also, like, let's talk about the fact that its original Japanese name is in fact the cutie moon rod. And so they changed it to the moon scepter. Uh, I think this was a good example of um thoughtful localization where again it's not that it's not that the western audience doesn't know the words shooting moon or rod um but that to us that's a dumb name if you're native japanese speaker and it's being given a consciously english name there's a degree of remove from the adjective cutie and so it's carrying a different context and weight for for someone who's seeing that used as a secondary language within the work than for us to be like queen serenity is dramatically like here my beloved daughter use the cutie moon rod to say the run and you're just like the cutie moon ride <laughs> shooting <laughs> also like rod is more of a loading now into a native english speaker because it has a history in romance novel. So again, that's a localization decision where like you can literally just translate the word rod as like stick or staff or, or wander scepter. Like any yep. of those is fine. You're not changing what word it is intended to convey. You didn't have to use the word rod. You did not have to have it be named the cutie moon rod. So I think moon scepter is fine, actually. I Moon Scepter doesn't put me in mind of a sex toy, so... No, it's doing not. 
I like Moon Scepter a lot, actually. I wish there was... I, I'm, I'm of two minds because I like the crazy authenticity that comes with it. Like, everything in Sailor Moon has some a lightly embarrassing name to an Avis feature, which is not... It's, like, a little embarrassing to say. Yeah. And like, someone's I, like, I could fully get on board if they translated the Kaleido Moon Scope as the Kaleido Moon, moon Scope. That's very silly. They just stuck the word moon in the middle of the word kaleidoscope. I, what? English, English speakers love that, though. Yeah, we do. We are we a do. big fan of that. We like, I mean, as a we love a portmanteau. Like, we love all kinds of, like, mushing words together. It's great. So that one works because English speakers are like, that's, yeah, it's fine. Yep, it's Cloud of Moonscope, baby. Cloud of Moonscope, baby. That one, I think, works in a way with Chewy Moonrod. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the names of the other ones. Like, Moonstick is the first one. Yeah, yeah, the moon stick, the, which again, I think the crescent moon wand is a great translation of yeah. that uh, because it has a different connotation in English. Cutie moon rod, the, I believe the eternal teal was like never given a name officially until the toy was released. So that one, it doesn't have as, as floofy of a name as some of the others. I'm trying to remember what the heart shaped pommel with the little pokey outy sort of a sword with a hard-shaped pommel the oh that one what's it called was that I the don't. one yes was it? that might have been the one. one yeah heart moon rod was the other one that's the one she's going to get next yeah and then the eternal tr thank you ura we appreciate it yeah i think heart moon rod that works fine for me again we're with the rod thing which is not the best choice but, okay, but when you look at the like, heart moon rod so. you're like that's a rod yeah, and it's got a heart and a moon, and like you're, you get it. B and B players at Warlocks using rods. I always think this. I like my touchstone for that was I've been like a more metal with these. Uh, like of all of them, what I think of that as like a magical implement. That's what that was. Yeah, yeah. heart and moon. Yes, that is a, that is a yeah. magical rod in the occult sense, not in the other. It is. Carry on. So yeah, we've talked about that. Some localization here. The attack that, it, that the cutie moon rod is used for in Japanese is moon princess halation. In Deke, this has changed to moon scepter elimination, but only for a while. So it's moon scepter elimination up to a certain point, which may be the transition from Deke to Cloverway or from, yeah, I think from Deke to Cloverway. After that, they change it from moon scepter elimination to, I believe, moon scepter activation. I suspect they thought elimination was like maybe too violent, which is insane. But they do like there are some notes that although it's changed after a certain point to Moon Scepter activation, they still have it be elimination in I think the R movie, and yep. then in it's maybe S where for the first time it fails to work. She's saying elimination, and then. They, they forgot to make that one be activation instead. So there's a few places where they, at oops, still use elimination. I like elimination more. It sounds more hardcore. Plus, Moon Scepter activation is a little too similar to Moon Tier action for me. Yeah. I not, that, not that Deke uses act, Moon Tier action because they use Moon Tier magic, but still, in my head, there's an overlap. Uh, uh, I consistently forget what palation means. And That's why I know a lot of words, TM. so I'm not. A, I'm fine with that. Like I guarantee, a... that's why they chose to translate it as a different word. They were like, "Nah, that's too much vocab for people." Holation. What is this? And what? in fairness, if part of your localization goal is to sell toys, and you want kids to be able to swing the toy around and say the magic phrase. You're not going to need them to learn what halation means first. Uh, a, a halation is the spreading of light beyond its proper boundaries to form a fog around the edges of a bright image in a photograph or TV screen. Which is oh. dope. Which is dope. But yeah. it's not going to stick in the memory of the target. Oh, as in like the show. creation of a halo. Yeah. Halation. <laughs> okay, I get it. But it's not, that's not, you don't want to be teaching kids vocab when you're selling them toys you want to sell the tiara and have them yell moon tiara magic and chuck that frisbee at their sibling yeah, yeah. 
100%. In front of the TV. Ooh. Yep. What other demon do you know, if not your own sibling? Oh, all right. Anything else you want to talk about any of the episodes? Uh, what Madara Sailor Moon says that was really on the money? Yes, there was. Yeah, I don't remember what it was. I've slept since then. I know. Oh, do... oh, it was the... It had something to do with... I think it had to do with the, like, getting help or something like that. Yeah, it was something like about a trust an adult. Like, there was definitely yeah. an adult one. Well, it was about the VR thing where they all get separated and then it was like, hey, go to someone you know for help. Oh, I think it was. I think it was. And we were like, wow. Sammy goes to get Mamoru. It's the, the, oh, like, okay. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. For a, yes, frequently, when I don't remember something, I, I it, it's always because I've slept since then. It's gone. It's just gone. Well, no, but I enjoyed these episodes. Like, I am enjoying... I recently rewatched The Tree of Doom arc because I watched it, I think, like, a year or so ago for Sailor Tortilla's episode, which definitely checked out. But, so, I remember how good this arc was rewatching it. Yeah, it's surprisingly fun. And, like I said, they had a challenge to not only do filler, but to do filler that would make a transition from a sort of standalone season one into further seasons of the show yeah it's fun times i think they had a goofy old time with it um the the animation teams all got to be as horny as they wanted to be when they were designing the monsters for this and it's just what would you say is your favorite monster of the week out of all the episodes i'm gonna go with the the weird cherry blossom monster who was like both a beautiful lady and also had a cat face and also had some tree stuff it was, I like when they do the like weirdly specific yokai esque designs for their Yoma, where you're like, oh, they were referencing, yeah, I'm like, they were referencing something specific here. And so I thought, I always like when they do that. How about you guys? I agree with Echoma, the best one. Yeah. The best one. I've had them all. We oh. liked, we liked the dragon white forehead. There was a pink line with titties. Oh, uh, the first go home was like, a, again, a threateningly butch lady who was like Guile from Street Fighter with titties. That's always fun. I'm trying to think what the other one, what was the other one? I'm, no, no marks for the pink, horny pink lion. No points no. for horny lion. Too easy. Boring. Go to play. Last season, we had an episode with a lion. I want monsters goodness. of the week to sexualize things. I've been never considered sexualized. Yeah. <laughs> that's no, what season three is for. I'm, when that's that's what what we mean. I am no, wildly man. aware. Yeah. But yeah, like the stem and titties, I'd like that make faces. I just, I want to discover heretofore new realms of, wow, so we'll that with horny. Yeah. 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 Turn someone's great. Hell, sure. Um, yeah. What a, what a diverse that's... world we live in. That's what I want out of my monster. Same. I love that. And I think if I'm judging by that criteria, the Minotaur girl. Oh, I do have to shout out like the Minotaur girl. I love the horns on her design that become like super long. Like, and you'll hear me wax about that in, in Patreon because I, I genuinely like that's one of those like stick in my memory. I really loved the like prongs on the horns thing with the Minotaur girl. I got us this for us, for the furries having their time to shine. Listen, I've seen lots of furry art. You can do better than this. You can do sort of than this. It's true. It's true. In general, for Yoma, my favorite Yoma are always the ones that are derived off of some goofy object that you would never think of. Like the one that was like the salon Yoma, where it was like... It had like scissors coming out of one hand and like a blow dryer hand and things like that. Like when they're based off of some weird object mashed up with the idea of a monster, that's always delightful to us for me. And then I like the Cardians don't tend to be that. No, but we're coming up on my favorite Cardian who I cosplayed recently with you. Excellent. And I just love her because she's a chaos demon. <laughs> she's so good. But I'm excited. But. I'm trying to think of anything else. Wait, that's for the show. Yeah, yeah. The show. Uh, the there's a new ending sequence too. 
There's not a ton to say. Serena walks around, like she walks and various backgrounds scroll behind her and then she eventually looks at a lighthouse. Yeah. Oh. It's not very deep. Or I wanted to say I loved your Sailor Moon lore in the comments. I don't know if you two caught it. I don't remember what it was. I probably spotted it, but my memory is not. Oh, yeah, I did see that. Yes. Yes. Harris says, my Sailor Moon lore is I was maybe three or four years old and flipping channels on a Saturday morning, and I saw an episode where Serena is telling Prince Diamond that she'll never be his and shouts, moon crystal power, and the flat screen flashes pink. And just like that, I was converted. Feminism. What is feminism if not, like, fuck off, creep. Transforms in a spray of pink into someone that can kick your ass. Hells yeah. Oh, and then Ura also says a school festival with Ray. I am looking forward to so much. Like, it's my favorite one of these mini arcs. I'm looking forward to the Snow White episode. Oh my God. The Snow White episode is hilarious. The deep dunk is ridiculous. All right, let's go ahead and end it. And with that, so we come to the end of our show. Thank you for joining us for We Showed Just a G Slumber Party. Deep Dub episodes 41 through 45 discussion. As always, fellow movies, check us out on all our socials and follow us to find out the next time we're going live. You can find our links on our link tree. I host Monica. But I'm not too interested in it. Feel free to follow me. I am Gay Wizard Emporium on Tumblr. That is where I am keeping up to date with progress on my novel, which I am working on writing and getting published. And I promise that Sailor Moon fans will love, as well as see whatever else I'm up to and enjoying at the moment. So. Feel free to follow me there. That's really where I'm most comedian. If you don't have a Tumblr, you can just click that in the URL and still see everything I post because it's pretty cool. I you have to actually follow me or make it cooler. Yeah. Yes, and it'll be November 16th with Rizuki, and I will announce the topic on Instagram. Okay. Awesome. That'll be exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing what that one is because, as noted, we love Rizuki. We love Rizuki. She's the best. All right. I've been your co-host, Relia. If you like what I do and you want to follow me elsewhere on social media, you can find my most active socials popping up on the screen below. If you want to follow my cosplay adventures, go ahead and follow me on Instagram at Relia Lacadamon. If you want to follow my artwork, I'm on Twitter at Shazari for now, on Tumblr at Art Crystals, and on Blue Sky at, as Relia, where I'm trying to be more active as we are all kind of jumping ship from Twitter. Thanks, as always, for supporting the show and join us for our next slumber party on November 23rd. That's going to be the weekend before Thanksgiving. So bring your pumpkin pie, bring your whipped cream, feed me. Yes, we'll make it a nice, like, holiday cozy episode. Ooh, I'll make myself hot cocoa. Yes, let's make this fun and cozy. I love that. All right. And as always, I have been your host, Michi. You can buy my personal socials at MEW21 across the web. For my K-pop reactions with my bestie, Ray, you can find my channel with her at K-pop Voyage. For our parent show, Eternal Mooncast, you can find previously recorded episodes of our show on YouTube. This episode will be coming out not this Monday, but the Monday after at 7 p.m. Eastern. We should print. We appreciate any likes, comments, follows, or however you'd like to support our show in your own way. As a quick reminder, these have just been our personal opinions and we celebrate all respectful Mooney opinions here and have a good night.